Well, now to a three news exclusive bomb city USA, a true story about organized crime, murder and a fight for control that left everyone dead or behind bars. Over the next three Thursdays, we'll investigate Cleveland's underworld. You'll hear stories never before told from those who lived it. First up, we're digging into Cleveland's most infamous criminal, Danny Green. Obviously, somebody um, didn't like him or somebody. I'm not positive at this stage that uh, that they were after Danny or just the building or maybe just a fluke. But obviously, it, he's been in the headlines and the news, and uh, there's been times when other people have attempted it, uh, shots in his life, uh, a fatal situation, uh, the dynamiting a couple years ago. But uh, I have no idea, and I'm sure Mr. Green doesn't this time. He's a little shook up. He would treat the people in the neighborhood nice. He really did. The girls, the, the people that were hired up, and Every Thanksgiving, he bought uh, 50 20 pound turkeys, gave them away. Every Christmas, 50 20 pound turkeys, gave them away. Call up and say, uh, so I don't want to mention names, but he'd say, so and so is coming in. Give her On the shores of Lands, Cleveland, Ohio, one of the largest cities in America. From the 1870s, hundreds of thousands of immigrants came to work in its steel factories and heavy industries. During Prohibition, Cleveland's position on the border with Canada made it an ideal smuggling center and one of the most lucrative cities for organized crime in America. On Cleveland's east side, around Mayfield Road and Murray Hill, a thriving Italian section grew up. Here, Italian criminals took to bootlegging with as much zeal as their cousins in New York and Chicago. In the 1920s, two Italian gangs, the Lonardos and the Pirellos, slaughtered each other for control of the Cleveland Mafia. By the end of Prohibition, one dynasty had fought its way to the top. John Scalish became its boss. Scalish died in 1975 of natural causes. He was succeeded by James Licavoli, an aging capo. Licavoli's underbosses were Tony Liberatore, the Mafia's corrupter of politicians. Angelo Leonardo, who ran the family's gambling and drugs rackets. And John Calandra, the Mafia's frontman in legitimate business. The Cleveland family under Licavoli became the target of the federal strike force set up to fight organized crime in the city. Cleveland Strike Force is one of 16 across America. It's led by Steve Ola. Morning, Marguerite. Steve Washington. Thank you. His team of lawyers, detectives, and accountants are drawn from all arms of law enforcement. In the 1970s, the Strike Force began to penetrate the Cleveland Mafia, or Cosa Nostra. In 1975, John Scalish, who was reputed to be the head of the Cleveland La Cosa Nostra family, died of natural causes. At that time, James Licavoli was um, promoted and made uh, the head of the uh, La Costa Nostra family in Cleveland. At about that time, there was a, a rather uh, brash, young Irish racketeer uh, who was beginning to make his, a name for himself in Cleveland. And his name was uh, Daniel Green, Danny Green. And he um, controlled an operation of um, young Irish fellows who were beginning to uh, 
pose a threat and a danger to these traditional activities of the Cleveland uh, organized crime family, the, the La Cosa Nostra family. Danny Green and his Irish gang were challenging the Italians on their own territory. Green killed several of Licavoli's top lieutenants and started to move in on the Mafia's rackets. Danny Green believed that he could take over organized crime activities in northern Ohio. His idea was that he would do it under the Irish banner, which uh, he, he, he had a green uh, Lincoln. He, 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 uh, he, his, his, uh, everything, everything he wrote it was in green ink. He had a green flag in front of his uh, house, and this was his image, and he felt that he could take over organized crime uh, through this, uh, using his Irish group. He was very offensive about the Italians, I understand. Yes, he would get on television, call the La Cosa Nostra figures, figures maggots, and uh, he would, uh, they, they had made about eight attempts to kill, to kill him over a period of years, and uh, he, was, he felt he was indestructible. They blew up his house. Uh, he fell from the second floor to the basement, landed on a refrigerator, and walked away. They, they tried to kill him in a park when he was jogging. He uh, took out a 38 revolver and, and killed one of the, uh, the hitmen. They, uh, they made many attempts uh, on his life, which all failed. The Mafia couldn't kill Green, but they did blow up his ally, John Nardi, in May 1977. Green was now even more exposed, but he flaunted himself on television after Nardi's murder. Jenny, there was some speculation out on the street back in March that uh, John Nardi was a target. Did, did you talk to John Nardi at all about this? I haven't personally seen John in about three and a half months, but I did send him a message very recently that John be careful. It's out here very, very strong in the streets that somebody's out to get you. Now, from what I can say is, is that everybody says they heard this also. The investigator should start right there and go from who told you and where did they hear it from. Do you got any thoughts about where these people are from? I thought, I think poss possibly, most probably, the bomb was made here. The people could have been imported. To kill the Irishman now became the Cleveland Mafia's number one priority. After failing eight times themselves, they decided to bring in an outsider. The contract to kill Green was given to Ray Ferrito. Ray Ferrito was a hitman from California. Ferrito had already carried out a murder for the Los Angeles crime family. While I was in California, a problem arose with uh, a man who was uh, giving uh, many people problems uh, and uh, bringing a lot of heat by the law enforcement agencies to other people. And uh, was he was he a, I, uh, a criminal? Or? Yes, he was a criminal. He was a non-bank robber and burglar. And uh, I took care of that problem by. Uh, taking him out to the airport and shooting him in the head. Ferrito was a killer with an ambition. He wanted to join the Cleveland family. The bosses agreed to make him a member and cut him in on their gambling profits. He soon realized why they needed him to kill Green. Well, they were very disturbed. Uh, it seemed like every attempt that was made uh, either was fouled up or uh, it didn't work. The man was a green who was cautious, uh, by no means uh, ignorant. Uh, he took precautions, uh, precaution measures whenever he went somewhere, place uh, there was someone with him. Uh, he always carried a gun, and uh, he seemed like uh, a man that uh, was invincible, a uh, man with uh, nine lives. You know it's widely speculated that you are also a target in this so-called, quote, gangland war for control. What's your answer to that? The world of uh, the streets, I happen to have an unenviable position, a very inter uh, uh, enviable position of many people because I'm in between both worlds, a square world and a street world, and I think I have trust from both sides. But I have no, uh, no ax to grind, but if somebody wants to come after me, uh, we're over here by the Celtic Club. I'm not hard to find. Finding Green wasn't the problem. Killing him was. Green lived in a block of apartments where Ferrito first tried to kill him with a bomb in a box. FBI agent John Summer worked on the case. 
Now, Danny Green, although he lived a fast life, wanted to live in, a, in this, this uh, apartment because it catered mostly to the elderly. And uh, when he wasn't in the public eye, he could hide away up here without any uh, media. Up here on the uh, right, right near the front of the door, is where the bomb box was planted. At the time, which was in 1977, there was a lot of shrubbery there. It was a directional bomb box with a force uh, going out towards the door. And uh, they gave up on their attempts uh, to do it, mainly because there were so many elderly people uh, that were always seemed to linger by the doorway or uh, at least stand out waiting for buses and so on and so forth. The bomb was to be detonated across the street near the White House and uh, a streak of no nobility, I guess, on the part of the mob, they decided not to go ahead with the plan because so many innocent people would be killed. It was shortly after uh, we decided not to use the bomb box, which I called it, uh, that we decided to uh, tap his telephone. I got a key to an apartment in the building while in the building, we went down into the manager's office and found his lines and tapped the phone and hooked it up to uh, the dead phone that was in the apartment where we were living. Well, there was you... many phone calls that uh, we overheard. One, uh, especially that I remember, is that uh, he used to uh, be in contact with the uh, uh, FBI and uh, he gave an alias when he called the FBI, and he was an informant for the FBI. Uh, when this was told, or when the tape was heard by Licavoldi and others, uh, it confirmed what they had thought in the beginning, and it became uh, more of a thing we have to get him soon. In October 1977, Ferrito heard Green telephoning his dentist. When Green turned up for his dental appointment, Ferrito was waiting for him. We decided that uh, there would have to be more than one plan because uh, Mr. Green was the type of guy who uh, thought himself as a general. So we had a bank of crew. There was another crew there, two fellows with the high-powered scoped rifle who were parked in the uh, parking lot of the building where the dentist was located. And uh, they were supposed to take a shot at him if there was an opening. But they uh, chickened out and they left. And so we used the last uh, method that we had. That was the bomb car. We uh, had a car that was set aside and in the car, there was a box built to the side of the door of the car where we would put dynamite, which we would park next to his car. And uh, we would trigger it off at a distance. It happened that when he did come for his uh, dental appointment, we were there and waited till he uh, came out of the building. When he went to get into his car, uh, I ignited the, uh, the dynamite with the remote control device. Danny Green had lost his war with the Cleveland Mafia. The Irishman was dead. At that point, were you elated? Did you get any thrill out of having finally done the job? Yes. It, uh, I w wasn't elated because of I killed someone. I was elated because the job was done and I was going to become one of them and uh, share in the profits, uh, something that... Uh, since I was a kid, uh, I dreamed of, you know, I wanted. And that, this was my chance to do it. Didn't you have any, uh, any kind of uh, compunction, any uh, remorse? You'd, you'd got to know this man very well, hadn't you? Yes. Well, how does it feel to kill somebody that you, that you know every living breath of? Because you're tapping his phone, you're, 
you, you're living in the same building with him. What, what's it like to have a man as a target? Well, to me, it was like uh, having a glass of wine. It didn't mean a thing to me. I killed him, and, uh, and I, there was uh, no remorse that I killed the man, because that was part of my life. I was brought up uh, uh, all through my life believing that those, you just have to put them out of your mind. Those were things uh, or hurdles that you had to overcome. A man with a conscience uh, doesn't last too long on the streets. Green's killing in broad daylight in a car park caused a public outcry. At that point, uh, it became uh, apparent that uh, we had uh, a full-scale gangland uh, war occurring here, uh, that um, thus far it appeared that innocent people had not been victims of that war, but that certainly if it continued, that possibility was, was a great one. So it was determined that uh, an effort should be made, and a very concerted effort on our part, to um, attempt to solve these murders and attempt to put a stop to this, to this violence. As a result of that, we put a task force together under the auspices of, of the strike force, and uh, we set up this task force in an effort to, uh, to solve the, the murder of Green as well as the murder of one John Nardi, who was a Green associate and murdered uh, about four months prior to, uh, to Green. Do you want to review exactly what we accomplished with his testimony this morning? Right. The task force was made up of investigating lawyers, bomb experts, local policemen, and FBI agents. The FBI usually dominates strike force cases. Today, 1,500 FBI men investigate organized crime, a far cry from the early days of J. Edgar Hoover. Didn't we have uh, the shooting of Joe DeRose uh, that we just prosecuted, Pete Cascarelli on? We recovered a 22 with a silencer there, Yes, that was a 22, and then the... Uh, Cooperating in ways which would not have been possible before the strike forces were set up, the Cleveland team solved Green's murder in a few days. But it still needed some luck. That somehow he and the mob were enemies, right? Yes. Right. We caught a break in the sense that there was an eyewitness who heard the explosion and uh, was driving by, and the car with out-of-state Pennsylvania plates, which, which Ferrito was driving, sped by her, went right down a ramp onto an interstate. She recorded the, the number of, on the license plate, and we were able to, uh, to trace it back to someone who was uh, a friend of, of Ferrito's and uh, through some investigative work at that point, some grand jury investigation, some leads that were run, we were able to satisfy us that we had sufficient uh, probable cause to arrest Ray Ferrito, which we did. While Ferrito was awaiting trial, he learned the mafia bosses who had hired him to kill Green were planning his murder. Their treachery appalled him. All my life I've been one way and I always did what I was supposed to do. And now all of a sudden, I'm, I did them the biggest favor that they wanted done, and they're talking about killing me. And here I am in jail, waiting trial. And uh, it was at that time that uh, I decided to, uh, to flip. And uh, by flipping, I mean go to the authorities and tell them that uh, I wanted to talk to them, but I wanted a deal. It wasn't because I saw God or I read a Bible, you know. It was just that I thought at that time that I had to look out for me, Ray. And I thought that that would be my best move. So Ray Ferrito decided to betray the Mafia. His evidence would put the leaders of the Cleveland family on trial for murder. James Licavoli the boss who had brought the Cleveland family to the verge of destruction. John Calandra, the man who day by day had conspired with Ferrito to kill Green. Tony Liberator, who had organized the cars and the weapons for the murder. Licavoli's lawyer claimed they were innocent. I don't think that these men are, are, are dangerous. Uh, they're, they're gentle souls. Uh, uh, they're just misunderstood. And uh, that's, my, that's my feeling on the matter. I, I don't think that they're dangerous. Oh, don't touch that camera. Come on,
During the trial, Licavoli and Calandra showed how gentle they could be with waiting reporters and photographers. Get out of here! Son of a bitch! Largely on Ferrito's evidence, the strike force convicted the three bosses. James Licavoli was jailed for 17 years for conspiracy to murder and for controlling the Mafia. John Calandra was sentenced to 14 years for conspiracy to murder and for controlling the Mafia. Tony Liberatore was jailed for 14 years for conspiracy to murder and for controlling the Mafia. Within months, the family's last underboss, Angelo Leonardo, was tried for drug trafficking, murder and for controlling the Mafia. Despite attempts to play up his frailty, he was jailed for life. The strike force had put away the entire leadership of the Cleveland mob. But both the strike force and the FBI know the Mafia is far from finished. We haven't broken the back of, of the Cleveland La Cosa Nostra. I think we have a long way to go yet before we can say that. All we've done so far is to take the leadership out. Take the, the boss, the underboss, and the capos. We still have a very active organization here. The, the members and the non-members are still uh, conducting loan sharking, gambling, narcotics operations. We have to attack those operations now. There is too much money to be made by organized crime and there is too much money to be made in a city like cleveland ohio which is a large industrial blue collar town which has a ready and willing market for the goods and services that organized crime has to offer and they're not going to allow that gambling to dry up they're not going to allow that narcotics uh, use dry up they're not going to allow that prostitution use to dry up so it's not going to be forgotten there will be efforts made to reinstill that power here in, into cleveland the Mafia bosses have been taken off the streets of Cleveland. Putting them all in jail is the greatest success any strike force has ever had against a Mafia family. But the racket busters know the family isn't going to fade away. It will renew its leadership, reassert its power. Ray Ferrito knows that power. After three years in jail, he is back on the streets. The Mafia have sworn to kill him. I know that I'm as capable of taking care of myself as the guy that they send to take care of me. And uh, it's just a matter of time for me. And I'd be a fool to say that it isn't, that uh, sooner or later that, that they're going to get me.